Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest, Lissa Bachner, who's here to share with us her new book, Milo's Eyes, How a Blind Equestrian and Her Seeing Eye Horse Saved Each Other. Have you ever had an incredible bond with an animal and it changed your life forever? Well, this show's for you. So, Lissa Barkner has been ranked among the country's leading amateur equestrians. When she was three years old, she was diagnosed with two rare immune disorders, one which inflames her joints and the other attacks her eyes and led to her blindness. By the time she was 30, she'd lost her left eye and most of the vision in her right eye. Regardless of her lack of vision, Lissa continued to ride and compete at shows, jumping highest levels. Despite the crippling disease, painful surgeries, and her doctor's disapprovals, Lissa has never lost her passion for horses and riding. She has competed all over Virginia, where she's from, and in several other states on the East Coast. She has won four national rankings, 10 zone rankings, 82 nationally ranked classes, and 118 top three placings. Lissa graduated from Skidmore College with a BA in English and currently resides with her horses and dogs. So let's welcome to the show, Lissa Bachner. Hi, thank you for uh, having me. It's an honor and I'm very excited. Well, it's such an honor to have you here and to talk about your new book, Milo's Eyes. I have to tell you, Lisa. I mean, once I picked it up, I could not put it down. I read it cover to cover, and there are parts where I'm crying, where I was cheering both of you on. I mean, it is such a powerful book. So before we get into Milo's story, I really would like to start with your story. And what's your first memory of a horse? I was not a good baby. (laughs) So as my mother likes to tell me, I cried all the time. And they discovered when I was about two and a half that all they had to do was put me on a horse, put me around a horse, pick me up, let me touch a horse, and I would stop crying. So I discovered that there was something magical about these animals before I could even talk. Yeah, that real soul connection that you have with horses. Absolutely. Absolutely. Really with animals in general, I was, but I was always very happy if you put me around dogs, but, but nothing made me happier than horses. So why don't you share your story? Cause I, I know you went through some medical challenges as a very young child. Why don't you share that with us? Well, I was diagnosed with a very rare eye disease when I was around three or four. Uh, We really noticed it when, or my mom noticed it when I was three, that I was, she would point things out and I, I couldn't see them. But of course, as a child, people always ask me, well, didn't you know that you didn't see? And I said, no, this was all I knew. So no, I didn't know my vision was bad. And my left eye was affected much worse than my right eye. My left eye really didn't work very well at all. And um, so the disease I was diagnosed with was called uveitis. And it's an inflammation of the back of your eye, your retina, your optic nerve, that area. And there just weren't very many children with it. And eventually, after many surgeries, we had to scout out doctors. We were sent all over the country. I wound up in Boston at Mass Eye and Ear. And they performed some surgeries, but really they got to the point where they said, you know what, we really can't help anymore. The disease is too strong. It's pretty much taken over your left eye and uh, your right eye is going to fail eventually. We can't stop it. So by the time you're 13 or 14, you'll be completely blind. And my mom did some research. I also had uh, an immune disorder that was a borderline lupus as a child, pediatric lupus and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And, um, and so I was sent to NIH for that. And later after about maybe a few months of going to NIH, they said, you know, we're opening up a, um, a, uh, an eye, uh, department and, um, and we have a doctor named Dr. Alan Palestine, who is a specialist in uveitis. And so 
it was just really lucky that I got to start going to NIH, the National Institute of Health, and started to see Alan, who um, still there wasn't a lot of research, but at least I was in good hands for the most part. Um, yeah. NIH can be a little tricky. They they do want to experiment on you, but uh, between my mom and Dr. Palestine, I was protected. It sounds like they, you know, really worked together to get you the best treatment plan while a lot of this was still really unknown. They they really did. And oddly enough, when I was, they, now people are given injections in your eye and, um, and it's pretty commonplace when anyone has inflammation, macular degeneration, you get an injection in your eye. Well, I am old. I was born in the seventies and in the eighties when I was receiving this treatment, this was brand new. And when they came to me and they said, you know, I was maybe 11 or 12, 13. And they said, all right, well, we're going to put a needle in your eye. I went, Oh no, you're not. Guess again. And, uh, and I was terrified. Well, one of the doctors that was there to learn and to assist wound up being my doctor now at Baskin Palmer, Dr. Janet Davis, who is world renowned. And, and she's so funny when I went in to see her for the first time, when I received my shot in the eye, she looked at her assistant and said, watch out, this one's difficult. I said, well, that was a long time ago. I mean, I've gotten better. So, well, I don't know. Yeah. If someone came to me with a, a needle they want to put in my eye, I'd probably have a hard time too. So, you know. Well, as much as I enjoy the sympathy and the empathy, I will tell you, and for everyone out there who one day, I hope not, but might have to have an injection in your eye, you don't have many nerves in your eye. You have nerves around your eye and the flesh, but inside your eye, there aren't a lot of nerves and you do feel it, but it's not that bad. I promise. Yeah, I, I know they do that today to help a lot of people um, <clears throat> with their eyesight. In fact, one of my aunts has that done. And she's had like five shots already mm-hmm. and doing very well. So, oh, good. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it might sound a little like it'll make you cringe, but it's, it's worth it, doing. It really does. It, it, you know, there was that old adage, you know, stick a needle in my eye and you thought, oh, that's the worst thing. And it's, it's, it's not that bad. And I'm not a big cheerleader for steroids, but they do help, especially when they're given a lot of times in your eye. Yeah, so. different different things they could do to fix that, or at least a- attempt. You know, they're working to save or uh, prolong in many ways. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and so my goodness, that's a lot of medical stuff to go through as a young person. How did horses work with you during all this that was going on? Well, the horses really they worked in two different ways. They were an excellent bribe. Um, because I was, I don't want to say I was a big chicken, but I think I was, I was a big chicken. And, um, I was often, my mother would tell me that if I, if I just had, you know, if I was okay for the blood test, or if I just went through this uh, surgery, I could get right back to the horses. And that was always a way to get me through a surgery. But also, uh, because I was often out of school, and because I was eventually given huge glasses, I, I really didn't have many friends because as we all know, um, it, it, you just don't make a lot of friends when you're different. And I was definitely different. I would have bandages over my eyes or my left eye didn't work and it looked a little different. And so the horses were really my friends as well. Um, you know, I, you do what you can when you're a little kid and I would get home from school and immediately go to the barn. And, and then I would have my time with the horses and I would tell them about my day and I would play with them just like you would a friend. Well, I know animals can be such great listeners. What was the first horse that you think you owned? (laughs) I had a little tiny pony. He's a liver chestnut. I thought he was the most beautiful creature in the world and his name was Duke. And I rode him and I honestly don't remember. I mean, in my, in my mind, I rode him for years. I probably only had him for about a year, maybe six months, but this pony was my life. And one day my mom came to me and said, 
very sadly, unfortunately, Duke has to leave. And I said, what do you mean Duke has to leave? He's my pony. And, and I found out that Duke was actually not my pony. A very nice family owned him and had loaned him to us. And they were moving and they were going out of town. And uh, for a while, and they were taking Duke with him. And so oh, I was devastated. And then my mom very quickly realized that I, I was not well without a horse or a pony or something with four legs, a tail, ears, you know, that I could ride. And, um, and so she very nicely found a pony and they bought it, a little tiny white pony named Marshmallow. She was really my first one that was all mine. Good old Marshmallow. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, there are still pictures of to this day of me riding Marshmallow and um, I I can't see them very well, but I, I like knowing that they're there. So. Well, and it's just, you know, to have that connection as a child, I mean, because time does go by, it feels like forever, you know, and we have these deep connections with animals. Absolutely. And, you know, and I I felt like everything was okay. As long as I had a horse in my life, I could get through whatever was happening, whether it was surgeries or loneliness. And and eventually it actually did help me. I did find uh, my best friend through the horses. Uh, she was my best friend. I think we met when I, we were maybe eight. And to this day, Sarah, Sarah is still my best friend. And we had the connection through the horses. And so there, I learned that through the horses, there are people that, that we were alike and that we found sanctuary in these animals. And we had that in common and we could bond over that. Yeah, it's always so comforting. And, you know, one really good friend is worth 10, you know, or 100 just acquaintances, you know, it absolutely is just that one person that you can connect with and talk with. And so as your journey progresses, when did you start moving from marshmallow to maybe bigger horses? Uh, I, it was very natural. Um, my mom, I my mom could tell that this was all I wanted to do. And, um, it made, it was, it gave my life a quality that without the animals just wouldn't have. And so as I got taller, uh, and I outgrew marshmallow, um, I just very quickly ran through small ponies, medium ponies, large ponies. And then I was 18 and I was about to go to school. I had, you know, I was about to go to college and it just seemed natural that it was time to give up on the horses. And my brother died in a car accident and I didn't have a horse and I had no outlet for um, the pain and the angst. And, um, and so my mom actually bought me another horse um, and it was It was my first real show horse. I had ridden, we had had other horses that really couldn't have um, taken me to the level I wanted to ride at. And so my mom bought me a very nice show horse and that was Fire Nice. And his name was Chucky in the barn. And that was my first one. And it was the first time a horse really saved me. So that was the first real one. And, um, and he actually went to college with me for a little bit. Well, I'm so sorry for your loss. And I mean, there, nothing can replace it. And my heart goes out to you just Thank having you. to go through that. Yeah. And people ask me why that part of my life is not in the book. And, um, and it was because that would be a whole nother book. So <laughs> Um, and maybe, maybe that will be one day, but, um, but, uh, so there not is yet. it. Not yeah. yet. Not yet. Well, and so you were saying, you know, your new horse went with you to college. What was that like? Uh, it was fantastic. Really. It was like taking one of my best friends to college with me. Um, and I came from a very secluded life. I'd gone to an all girls school all my life. In fact, I it was even the last couple of years, I went to a boarding school. Um, and 
I, boys were scary to me and, um, and large classes were scary. And so I, and I knew how to relate to people with horses, but not to people my own age, really. I I was not socialized. (laughs) And so the horse having Chucky at college did help and it did help me meet other people. And um, right about the time Chucky was getting a little too old uh, and was starting to not want to do what I wanted to do, um, and we were retiring him, I was coming out of my shell and learning really how to talk to my my colleagues, my classmates. And so, and I think I've been asked out on one of my first dates around then. So that was very exciting for me to enter this new life. And despite, I mean, I still continue to ride. Skidmore has a great riding program. And so I did continue to ride. There has not been a time in my life where I haven't had horses. I just was learning to balance um, being a student in college and enjoying myself and the barn. When did you start competing or have you always been competing? I've always competed. Um, I my first show, I was four or five. Um, I have always competed, not necessarily at the level that I compete at now, but there has always been uh, horse shows. And um, even in high school, I competed on the, the team there. So I am, I mean, I am so competitive, it's ridiculous. So, um, and uh, even, no one wants to play Monopoly with me. I'm a known cheater. So, (laughs) or at least they don't want me to be the banker. So um, anyway, so I've always competed at this point. It wasn't until really after, a little after college, uh, when Milo entered my life, that I was competing at a level that I, an echelon that I never thought possible. Um, And yet there I was. So, and I know at this time you're mourning a loss, you're going through, you know, these procedures and gradually losing your eyesight. I mean, how, of course we know mourning a loss is just makes people um, feel certain ways. I mean, how was your life at that time? Um, I think it was, you know, I was just out of college. Um, I had tried to work in Boston at Saks Fifth Avenue for a little bit. I wanted to be a buyer until I realized you had to do math. And then I quickly realized that was not going to be for me. Um, And so I moved back to Maryland and with a horse and, um, and I moved back and I, I was just lost. The only thing I knew for sure was that I could ride. And so it was a very difficult time for me. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I actually started going to grad school um, to become a special ed teacher and um, realized I didn't want to do that either. I was just lost. I was flailing. And so I went to work for my stepfather at his car dealership and loved it. I was shocked. I thought I have this education and am I wasting it? But I loved it. And so... Um, I was doing that for a little while. And, and then eventually when I started losing my vision, they really frown upon people selling cars without a license. (laughs) So who can't drive? So I gave that up and um, focused on the horses more until I just didn't, didn't have the vision to do it. So, and and the reason I, I asked that is because we have so many people right now who are going through a loss of one form or another and feeling grief and feeling depressed or just like they they're like how you mentioned floundering and i felt like your story was so empowering for so many people that are going through that experience in their life grief itself is blinding um because you cannot see um and i mean that figuratively because you you cannot see through it it's just very dense and so you can't see to the next page of your life or the next moment of your life, because all you feel is pain and it encompasses you. And no matter what, all the, the trite sayings that it will get better. And tomorrow is another day. Thank you, Scarlett O'Hara. It's, it's, 
it's you it's just almost too difficult to get past it until you do and um and i i hate to say it but it is it is time because it's a gigantic open wound that sometimes you just can't stop the bleeding right away and you just somehow have to know somewhere in your heart in your soul wherever you feel it that it's not forever even though it can feel like it will last forever you know always and there is there are parts of it. I, mean, I still mourn my vision i still mourn my brother i still mourn every horse and pony and dog and family member that i've lost but as we know it's still there but it does subside it does get better and life balances i think and it's everything, hard to see it sometimes yeah even with perfect vision right <laughs> Absolutely. There are days where I'm thrilled I don't have vision. When I look in the mirror, I, I don't, the last time I actually saw myself, I was 29. Well, I'm almost 50 now, and I can only imagine. So, you know, no one really ages for me, which everyone likes. Um, my brain actually puts in, when I see my mother, for instance, my brain immediately fabricates the person that I'm seeing. And the person that I saw the last time I saw her. So to me, my mother looks like she's in her 50s still. And uh, and actually, from what I hear, people tell me she actually still does look like she's 50. So she's pretty amazing. Well, I have to tell you, you look fabulous. So, you know, keeping that image of you being 22, I would say go for that because you absolutely well, look fabulous. You. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, I am very, was very slow to mature. So maybe that's part of it. But, um, but you know, there, I don't see the fences. People always ask me, you know, aren't you frightened to jump this big? And I reply, I don't see the fence until I'm maybe uh couple of feet away from it. So I don't really realize how big I'm jumping. And by that time it's too late. I better just bend over the horse's neck and hope for the best. So um there are some times where it it's not always the worst thing in the world. Not the greatest, but it's not the worst. And I was a terrible driver. It's a great even with some vision, I was a bad driver. So it, this is, you know, this is my gift to everyone else on the road with me. <laughs> well, so let's talk about Milo. So Aww. at what point did that lovely horse come into your life? Milo uh, entered my life on New Year's Day. Really, it was midnight and it was 1999 and that Prince song, party or whatever, party like it's 1999 was playing everywhere, everywhere I went. And I walked into the barn. It was freezing cold because I was in Maryland. And the big, gigantic uh, trailer was pulling up with horses. And I met my trainer at the time, Bob Crandall, who's very, very well known in the horse world. Um, and it was such a privilege to ride with him. We're still very good friends. And the trailer pulls up and a horse, two horses get off. And one of them is very nice looking and clean and very sweet. And, um, and another one gets off and he is very skinny, filthy, dirty. He smells bad. He's just got this awful ears pinned back, terrible look on his face. And I looked at Bob and I said, uh, that one better not be mine. <laughs> And he said, it is. I had purchased Milo from Europe. We had imported him and, um, and he was called a Zangershai. And I knew that his mother had been an Olympic horse. His father had been a very famous horse. And I got lucky and was able to buy this one. And he was a train wreck. And, um, and I later found out that Milo was bred to be the next German Olympic horse. And he just from day one had was not meeting the standards. So luckily in Europe, all they have are jumpers, dressage, eventing, uh, which are three different disciplines of riding. In the United States, we have something called hunters and hunters do not have, to, we don't go fast. We jump up to four foot in the regular classes or some classes we jump bigger. As an amateur rider, I only jump three foot six which is big enough. 
and um, and it's based on quality of the horse, the quality of the ride, um, the athleticism, the style they jump in, and the style they move. And so Milo fit that bill perfectly. And um, but first we had to figure out how to get him to stop trying to bite and kill us. And I um, mean, it was a long time, but when he walked off the trailer and finally stopped trying to kick me, um, I just, I looked at him and he had marks from spurs and whips all over him. He had not been treated well. Oh my God. And I immediately understood him and why he was behaving like this. And there was a part of me that wondered if I would ever be able to, to fix this horse um, and change his mind about humans. And he lowered his head and looked in my eye, which is something horses tend not to do. Um, but he was, and he just looked defeated, except for this little glow. He had this incredible glow in his eye. And I just, the depths of them were fire. And I thought, you know, I, I think this horse needs another chance. And um, and so I spent the next really year of my life dedicated to Milo and it paid off. We were inseparable by the end of that year. He not only looked just phenomenal, you know, his, his, that glow that I saw really took over his whole body and, um, and he would walk in the ring and the judges would tell me they didn't know what it was about this horse because he was really, he was a bay horse, which is most horses and um and but and he was little he wasn't huge but there was something about this horse that captured their attention and eventually they were rooting for him so my I didn't show Milo until I lost my vision but um Bob showed him professionally and they won quite a bit and as they were winning and I was really doing the groundwork with Milo my our relationship really just blossomed and we were we could read each other's minds as much as I could understand a horse and a horse could understand me we were inseparable well I believe that we can have these really deep connections with animals where we get to the point that it is that kind of you know we don't really need to say anything you know we we kind of know what the other one wants to do oh yeah he could I could walk in there and have a bad day or just was a little off and he would know that and he would um he would grab me Milo was very funny if I walked over to him he would hang his head of course he's much bigger than I am he would hang his head over my shoulder and pull me into his chest and it was very much like a hug and then he would very softly blow into my ear with his nose and I always thought that was so odd and I was telling someone about it one day day and they were a horse breeder she was a horse breeder and she said that's very interesting the mothers do that to their babies their foals when they want to calm them down and Aww. I realized that Milo was doing that to calm me down so and that was exactly and I started reading about it and that was exactly what he was doing so um, that is was, so sweet using yeah. the, the, what he knew is like okay we need to calm her down. We're going right. to, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, if I could have just taken him everywhere, it would have been great. So, but, you know, <laughs> he would do that to calm me down and, and it were, I mean, it did work. I, whatever mood I was in, whenever he did that, I was just immediately, um, not necessarily happy, but I was okay with whatever was happening in my life. So. You know, it works. Yeah. Makes it a little bit easier, you know? It does to know that something as special as Milo loved me. Um, it just made everything okay. Okay, you're gonna start making me cry now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I already am a little bit. So I'm staring. <laughs> So hey, okay. here we, yeah, well, that's okay. I'll cry with you on this one. Okay, good. So, but, and, and, you know, just reading his story, you know, that how you explain the story a little bit, it's just, it's heartbreaking that people can treat animals that way. I mean, he was, from, you know, from what I understand, he was just not only just treated bad 
physically, I mean, he's like malnourished, but just the mental and emotional, I mean, it looked like he was just so happy to be your horse. When he was, he was so, but I was happy to be his human. I mean, I was just so, um, we were so loyal to each other, really. Um, he was, he was very special and, and yes, you know, in, in, in his old owner's defense, um, they are, horses are thought of more as a commodity in Europe for the most part there. Of course, there are people who love their horses, but he came from a sales barn and he was very expensive to create. You know, they had stud fees, they had all sorts of things. And he was supposed to be an Olympic horse worth millions upon millions of dollars. And although to me, that's exactly what he was um, priceless. In Europe, he just wasn't. He wasn't going to be what they wanted him to be. And they actually, at one point, said that he had no heart. And, of course, I later found out that this horse had more heart than anything I had ever known in my life. Yeah, he's definitely worth more than a million dollars, you know, any day of the week. Absolutely. (laughs) If I had it, I would certainly pay that to have him back. I mean. I, I even now I search for horses that are even related to him distantly. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm always very happy when I find one. Oh, well, especially having that level of unconditional love, you know, during the times that you're going through, I mean, that must've really helped. It did. You know, there was a time when I was really losing my vision quickly and I was, the blindness was looming ahead of me and I was terrified for a few different reasons to go out and see him um, at the barn or um, at the horse show, if he was at a horse show near me. I, um, I knew that Milo would sense there was something going on with me and I didn't want to share that sorrow with him. And I was also terrified because I didn't want people to see me blind. I had always felt like I was such a strong, sure-footed person. And this was such a weakness in my mind that I didn't want help. I didn't want people to see me fall, which I was doing a lot. Um, I didn't want people to see me sad. And I didn't want to share it with Milo. And the times that I did see him... There are a few times where I, I was taken out to see him. Um, I It made me so much stronger. So looking back at it, I don't know why I was so frightened to see him because he gave me so much strength and the power to go on. And you guys also did very well, you know, around at the different shows that you went to. You were awarded quite a few um, different awards, I understand. Yes. Well, eventually. Um, got back on Milo because again, Bob Crandall made me, I took him for, uh, I was able to, um, I did go completely blind and through, uh, really a miracle. And my mom, again, I, my doctor friends, I did regain a little bit of vision and it wasn't what anyone would call workable, but I, Bob came to my apartment where I was living in Baltimore and told me I had to come out to the barn and see Milo. And so I went out and I started going out every day. He took me to the barn every day. And one day I decided to take Milo for a walk and I put a lead rope onto his halter and I took him out to, for a walk. And uh, Milo, as I, every time I walked, Milo would put his chin, rest his chin on my shoulder. And he was actually steering me, I realized. And he was helping me so I wouldn't fall down into anything. And I let him graze. And eventually Bob found us and he was very upset (laughs) because he said, you know, you don't see well enough. What are you doing? You could have gotten hurt. And, um, and I said, no, Milo's helping me. And he said, fine, if you can walk the horse then you can ride the horse. And that's how I started riding again. And, um, and eventually we said, okay, well, let's, let's show. And the first show was an absolute disaster, horrible. 
And, um, and I was going to quit. I thought, okay, I've done it. I'm going to kill myself and the horse. And worst of all, people are going to make fun of me. And I was going to quit. And that was that. And then something happened that made me decide that I'm not going to quit yet. Not until I'm winning. So after a lot of work um, and a lot of patience on Bob's part and on Milo's part, I started winning. And once I figured out how to ride with very little vision, um, I started winning a lot. And about a year later, we started out jumping very small. We moved up to three foot jumps. And then eventually Milo and I were jumping three foot six. And, um, and I had to make a change in my trainers. Bob had taken a, a um, private job and, and I moved to ride at another barn that Rachel Kennedy owned. And when I got there, she said, what are your goals? You've already won a lot on this horse. What do you want to do? And I said, I really want to ride in the amateur division and it's nationally ranked and and she said, are you, do you see well enough to jump three foot six? And I said, no, absolutely not. And she said, okay, I'll tell you what, if you are champion at these three shows, and she named three very, very difficult shows um, with probably about 60 people in my division. She said, if you're champion at these three shows, you can move up to the amateurs. And I said, well, the likelihood of that is very slim. And, uh, we were champion at all three shows and congratulations. My, thank you very much. And, uh, and, uh, we moved up to the amateurs where we won the country several times. Um, so we loved the country and, um, it was really, uh, it was all Milo. This would, I would never have been able to do this without Milo and Bob Crandall and Rachel Kennedy. And they were just my mom. So it wasn't just, I wasn't such a brilliant, fantastic rider. It was really, it took everybody. And, um, and I'm still eternally grateful. I'm still very good friends with, um, my two trainers. And, um, and so it was really, it wasn't all me. It really sounds like a team effort. And, you know, I know your, your subtitle of your book talks about Milo being a seen eye horse, do you really, I mean, it sounds like he, he knew that you were blind. Do you think that he figured without that out? Without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Um, there were times I would steer him in the wrong, wrong direction completely. And he would ignore me. Oh yeah. No, he was, he was absolutely. I mean, there were times I would aim for the wrong fence and he would do his best not to jump that fence or he would do his best to say, you are not right. Please, let's not know. So, and I learned to, that was really part of the journey of learning to ride was letting go and trusting the horse because I can't see. And, and he became my eyes and I could feel, you know, when, when you are, have been a rider for as long as I've been, you really learn to feel uh, the rhythm of a horse's canter and the way that their body shifts and moves, especially their hind end. Um, and so it really, he would, he would send me these signals and I learned to look for them. And um, so, no, he absolutely knew I couldn't see. You guys were really saving each other there, you know? It's, absolutely. Uh, what a, what a, just a beautiful, beautiful story. And I mean, my goodness, to be able to do all that you've done. And I've seen videos of you just recently, actually, of doing um, a show and doing some of the jumps. And it is just phenomenal, the stuff that you're doing. I, you. I'm just, I mean, there's no way I could do that. And, you know, I've been on horses a little bit here and there, but not anything. I mean, you do it just beautifully. Well, thank you very much. Um, I continue to need uh, partners and trainers and friends who help me. Um, so, and of course the videos are usually 
my best effort. <laughs> there are videos out there that uh, thankfully are not posted for public. That's like, oh boy. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I, I rem- um, it, remember you saying you grew up in the 70s. I was in the 60s. So it was before iPhones and all that. So we, that's when we got our practice in, right? <laughs> so, oh, thank goodness. Right, right. Oh, that would just, would, I, I always cringe. Maybe life would have been a little bit easier if I had a cell phone back then, but oh no. <laughs> Social media, no, no, no. I mean, talk about, I really wouldn't have had friends. <laughs> Sarah probably wouldn't have been my friend. Terrible. So I'm lucky. Hmm. Well, I, I think at that time, I look back on the time that I had and it's like, I learned so much and here you really had this time to really deeply connect with Milo in a way that most people never really connect with a, another animal. No, this was an absolute, um, this was a rarity for sure. And I, I always say I'm just the luckiest person in the world because um, I, I lost my vision and yet found so much more. Um, so and I, I think if I had remained uh, with workable vision or even a right eye that worked, I wouldn't be this person. I wouldn't be as content. I wouldn't have certainly wouldn't have had the experience with Milo and my friends and and everything else. So no, I'm, I'm so lucky and I don't see myself get older. So yay. There's that. All the bonuses, all the bonuses. Right. <laughs> so, so what do you want people to take away from your story? You know, I, I think about that often and I realized it wasn't, I thought I want them to understand that horses are magic. Well, that wasn't really it because if you don't see animals that way, I don't know that I can convince you. Um, but in the book and in my life, I have often been told I can't do something because I'm blind or because, uh, the technology isn't there. You know, we, we, we don't know how to help you. The, a lot of people said, as I was losing my vision and I learned that a problem can present itself at the most inopportune time and you're not always prepared for it. And sometimes the solution to that problem isn't right in front of you. Sometimes you really have to look for it. And sometimes nobody can find it, but it doesn't mean it's not there. And so that is actually what I want people to take away from this is that just because someone says there's nothing that can be done, that's not true. There's always something that can be done. You just really have to find it. So even if something seems incurable or nothing's going to work out, it doesn't always work out the way you think it's going to work out, but there is an answer. So sometimes it's not the answer that you want, but there is an answer. So you just really have to look for it. And it goes a little bit beyond you always have to have hope. It goes beyond that. It it's hope is great. And I held on to hope for a really long time, but when I had four or five doctors and specialists telling me that nothing could be done for my vision, that wasn't true. You just, you have to have help and you have to realize that there are answers, even if they're not in front of you, they're there. Well, and and with your mom, I mean, she's such a hero in your life being the advocate that she was. Absolutely. And yes, I mean, certainly not everybody, I wish everybody could have a mom like mine. Unfortunately, there is only one and, um, and, uh, and it's too bad, but there, there are moms who are just as strong as she is and fighters like she is and, and they have passed that down to their children. So, And if, if there isn't a mom that there's a dad or there is someone else in your life who will fight for you. And if there isn't, then fight for yourself. Um, but it's, um, it's very important to have the will to find those answers. It can be done. And like I said, it's not, I, I didn't get my vision all back. I got very little back, but that was okay. So. Um, you know, just these answers come in forms that you're not always expecting, but they do come and you can get through 
those times in your life. I mean, I, I absolutely, when I lost my vision, I was a hundred percent plotting my death every day. The problem was it was, okay, well, I'm going to swallow a bunch of pills. Well, I can't find them anymore. How do I get there? And then eventually maybe, you know, after I would think that it just became easier to think, okay, I'm not going to do that. So how am I going to, how am I going to make my life better? How am I going to get through this? So, but I, I am a cheerleader for determination, but I also know what it's like when everything just seems lost. Well, my goodness, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. Where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your book? Uh, The book can be purchased. Milo's Eyes can be purchased really anywhere where books are sold. Uh, Barnes and Noble, I think, has it online. I know Amazon books a million um, and lots of local bookstores, which I'm a big proponent of. Um, and they can certainly order it. Um, if you want to learn more about my son, really it's all in the book, but people can absolutely connect with me through, um, through social media. If they want, I'm on, um, and it's very simple. It's LS Bachner because I wasn't creative. Um, but I'm on, um, all platforms of social media so they can find me there. And I'm always happy to help anyone or answer questions as much as I can. And of course they can see your YouTube channel and watch you jump, which is just phenomenal. I I just really love watching that. Oh, thank you. I am actually adding uh, more to that uh, today. I, I have a friend coming in and we're going to add some more videos. And um, and actually we're starting to put on some videos of people who have had other challenges, not necessarily vision, but other challenges. So just to, just to show that I'm not the only one. Oh my goodness. I cannot wait to see those videos. We need more people in the world that make such a positive impact, just like you, Lissa and who inspire people to move beyond whatever it is they're facing and just take one step forward every day to see what they can accomplish. And the amazing thing is in no time, you'll actually be in a whole new place. So my goodness, thank you so much, Lissa. Make sure to visit and subscribe to Lissa Bachner's YouTube page. Her name is spelled L-I-S-S-A. Last name is B-A-C-H-N-E-R. And there you can view some of her videos of her most recent events. And I have to tell you, they are stunning. Well, Lissa, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you very much, Marian. This was an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you, Lissa. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Milo's Eyes. How a Blind Equestrian and Her Seen Eye Horse Saved Each Other. Milo's Eyes is available to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And if you don't see it on the shelf, ask for them to order it. And of course, remember to support our indie bookstores. For all those animal lovers out there, or those overcoming difficulties, Milo's Eyes is the perfect gift for everyone. Make sure to pick up a few copies, not only for yourself, but to give away as gifts. We're going to take a moment to hear from our sponsors that make Moments with Marianne possible. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special. 
when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com If not me, then who? This ethos is driving the Travis Manion Foundation to empower veterans and families of fallen heroes to develop character in future generations. In 2007, Marine First Lieutenant Travis Manion was killed in Iraq while saving his wounded teammates. Travis's legacy lives on in the five words he spoke before leaving for his final deployment. If not me, then who? Guided by this mantra, veterans continue their service, developing strong relationships in the community and thrive in their post-military lives. Visit TravisManion.org and ensure the character of our nation's heroes lives on in the next generation. If not me, then who? There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and souls. While we're at the end of our time today, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.